Our scripture today is taken from Romans chapter 4, verse 25, through chapter 5, verse 2. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for braving the traffic and whatever you had to do to get over here on the island. We very definitely appreciate those who could worship with us in person and all, also those of you who could join us online. We're so grateful for everyone, wherever you are, coming together to join us. I don't know how many of you know that before I became a pastor, I worked for several years in the IT industry, in the computer industry. So by hiring me as your pastor, you get an extra bonus. You get like a free IT guy thrown in for the mix. So uh, we're going to start the sermon today with a little computer tip. So you don't get this with every sermon. You know, this is free, no extra charge. It's just a little computer trip, tip. Uh, sometimes when you're typing on your computer, you, you type a phrase or a sentence, and you decide you don't want that change. You, you want to undo that. You want to get back to what it was before. Well, there's a secret uh, key combination built into every computer that lets you undo and reset back to where you were. So if you're on a Windows PC computer, computer, you hold down the control key and hit the Z key at the same time. So hold down control and hit Z. If you're on a Mac computer, you'll hold down the command key and hit Z at the same time. And you'll see whenever you do that, it just undoes the change and puts you back just the way it was before you started. Now, I realize some of you may know that because I realized when I came here, all of you are computer experts. I knew that when I came here. But uh, there may be one of you, two of you that didn't know that secret to undo. Don't you wish there was an undo key in life? You say something, you do something, you make a decision. If there was just some secret key that you could push to, to go back to the way things were. I've been married for 36 years, and I've looked for that undo key many, many times. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> My wife's here, she'll attest to that fact. Right? But it's not that easy in life, is it? When you do something, you start a chain reaction. You hurt people. You uh, start digging yourself into a hole. You have to start equivocating and explaining. And sometimes you lie and kind of deny and you just create more of a mess. Last week, we started a new series called Why the Cross? And we concentrated last week on the problem that God is seeking to solve in the cross. And we came to a conclusion that underneath all the problems that we face in the world, there's one big problem. And that is that we are all wrong until God makes us right. Individually, collectively, we keep making wrong decisions. We keep making mistakes. And Every time we do, we start a chain reaction. It creates a mess over centuries. That's the mess we're dealing with. God has built spiritual laws, moral laws into our, our creation. And when we violate those, it breaks things. Many things have gone wrong. That's the problem that God is seeking to address in the cross. And it's a big, deep, far-reaching problem. I mean, how do you make wrong people right? How do you change them and make them different? Especially given all the centuries of damage that's been done, how do you undo that? How do you take us back to the place that we were in the beginning when God put us in this garden where we loved each other and loved God? How do we get back to that place? How do we reset Well, God addresses this problem in the cross, and we've been following Paul's argument through the, his letter in Romans. Uh, last week, we looked at the first three chapters, and if you go back and look at it, uh, that first three chapters and into chapter four, Paul focuses on the problem that God is solving and the way he solves it in Jesus. 
And eventually we get to a summary statement. It's at the end of chapter 4, verse 25. We're going to start there today. We're going to look at this summary statement. This is his conclusion to which he's been building through these first four chapters. He simply says that Jesus our Lord, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Now the key there is that word justification. In the original language of the New Testament, it comes from a root word that essentially in our English language simply means right. We can compare our human word justice. When we cry for justice, we want the wrongs to be addressed. We want the right to be done. We want our rights. We want things to be right and go right. And so what Paul is telling us in this short summary statement is that it's through the cross and through the resurrection that God is making us right again. That's what he's doing. He's justifying us. He's making us right again. See, when God started all this, he created what he wanted. He created a family. He created a family because he wanted to love that family, and he wanted them to experience his love, and he wanted to teach them to love one another. That was what God wanted. But then that first family decided that they loved themselves more than God and more than each other, and they started to make wrong decisions. And wrong things started to happen. When God created, everything was good, very good. It was right. Things were working the way they're supposed to, but now things started to go wrong. The very good world started to go bad, and then it got worse. And so God is left with a dilemma. He could just end it all. He could just judge the world then. He could have just decided these people no longer deserve to live, and he could have ended it all. But then God would not have gotten what he wanted, which was a family to love, to have them love him, to learn to love each other. So rather than end it all, He started to reveal a plan, to restart things, to take it back to the beginning, to heal, to cleanse, to create that family again. And over time, it became clear that that plan was going to center in Jesus. And that work of restoring us and justifying us and making us right again was going to come together in this event we know as the cross and the resurrection. At the cross, Paul says he was delivered over to death for our sins. When we violated God's will and God's ways, we lost our right to live. We were created to live, to love him, to love one another. When we decided not to do that, we lost our right to live. We no longer deserve to live. In fact, We didn't deserve his love at that point. We deserved his wrath because we had violated why we were there in the first place. But God didn't stop loving us. He didn't give up on his dream, on his desire to have a family. And so he sent his pure and perfect son, Jesus, to take the penalty for our sin. Jesus was human like us, and so as the eldest, the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, he took the penalty and the punishment that all of us deserved. God did this tremendous divine exchange. He gave this pure and perfect life of Jesus in exchange for our imperfect and failed life. He died the death that we should have died. He exchanged his death for our death. He accepted the punishment the penalty. And so justice was done. Those who violated God were punished, but Jesus took that punishment upon himself. So in the scales of divine justice, the punishment has been paid in Jesus. But then God doesn't just leave it there. He gives this pure and perfect life of Jesus to us as a gift. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. He just gives it as a gift. 
And he raises Jesus up from the dead and gives them new life. So in Jesus, there is this new possibility of life. Our life doesn't have to end in disappointment and failure and death. Our life can go on forever, and we can be restored to the place that God always intended us to be restored, to dwell with him in all eternity, to love him, to experience his love. We began that life now, but that life, it never ends. All this God does for us in this death and resurrection of Jesus, it's a turning point in all of human history of God's revelation of his plan. So what God does in the cross and resurrection is so much more than an undo button. Because <laughs> here's the thing, if you and I, we hit the undo button, chances are in a few minutes we'll be having to hit it again. <laughs> We're going to mess up again. Uh, those first, that first couple, they could have, God could have said, okay, just don't do it again. I'll undo that. And then they would have done it again. No. What God does in the cross and resurrection is so much more powerful. He restarts all of creation. He takes us back to the beginning and says, I want to put you in a garden again. <laughs> Where you have a pure, clean, restored health. Where you don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear one another. You can experience my love. See, that's everything God promises in that cross and resurrection. Evil is judged, and a new life begins. So how do we participate, though, in that restoring work of God? How do we experience it? What's our role? That's what God does. What do we do? Well, Paul addresses that in the first verse of chapter 5. He says, therefore, since we have just been justified or made right through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is telling us it's through faith that we participate in God's restoring work. Faith is one of those words that we Christians throw around a lot, but I'm not always sure we understand what it is. This past week, I got to give the devotional at... Uh, Golfing for God. See, somebody has to suffer for Jesus. So I volunteered to give the devotional at Golfing, golfing for God. And so uh, there I wonder, wonderful uh, Irish dinner of corned beef and cabbage. <laughs> we had a conversation about what is faith? Because we all grew up in different traditions and we're trying to pin it down. Well, let me just kind of pin it down for us. Biblical faith, it's not wishful thinking. It's not a leap in the dark. It's not naive optimism that we hope things will turn out well. No, faith is based on something sure and certain. It's knowledge that we have of what's going on, that God's in charge. See, because biblical faith is rooted in a relationship with God. It's a trust that God is who he says he is and that this God loves us and is acting on our behalf. Even if we don't understand what's going on, even if things are going wrong, we have a trust relationship with our God who is sovereign, who knows all, who is all powerful, loves us, and has our best interest in mind. And God does not ask us to trust him without reason. He gives us very good reason. The scriptures are filled with Thousands of years of reasons to believe this God loves. And the most supreme example of all is here in this cross. That he would send his own beloved son to suffer as we suffer, to take on flesh, to experience the jabs and arrows of enemies that he could defeat like that, but to withstand them. And to die on a cross to accept the penalty for our sin and our failure and our wrongness. Whenever I start to doubt whether God really loves me, because I'm not feeling the love for whatever reason, <laughs> I look at this cross and I'm reminded only a God who loves me would do that. That's the faith that we have. It's not wishful thinking. It's sure and certain knowledge that the God we serve has acted for us, who loves us, and has given us this 
new life. And when we come into that relationship with God and we become convinced of his love and we accept the fact that we are failed, we get peace with God. That's the blessing that we get when we experience that knowledge of this God who loves us. We receive peace. Because up to then, we're in conflict with God. We're in disagreement with God. See, we think we're okay without God. We're good enough. We're, we're, we're basically okay. The rest of the world is messed up, but we've got it together. See, we're in conflict with God because God looks at us and says, this is not why I made you. I made you to be pure, complete, and whole. To love me, to experience my love, to love others. You've got a long way to go. And as long as we're in disagreement with God, there's no peace there. We're fighting with God. God is our enemy. We're in conflict. But when we look at the cross and we accept the fact that we're not what we should be, that we failed God, then we no longer fear because God says, I loved you so much that I gave my son. And now we have a father instead of the judge. We have a heavenly father that wants to mature us, cleanse us, strengthen us, heal us, make us whole. We have peace with God. We no longer have to live in fear of his wrath and his judgment because we're on the same page with God. There's a peace that overcomes our soul. We don't have to earn our love from God anymore. And also, we can have peace with others. Some of you, you've been hurt by other people and there's no peace. That hurt that they did. They did the wrong thing. They're the ones that sinned, and you're the one that doesn't have the peace. <laughs> Their evil owns you, owns your emotions. You can't sleep. It fills up your heart, your soul. There's no peace. But here's this cross. And what we can do when we get in those situations, and we can look at that cross, and we can realize that God cares that that person hurts you. He feels your pain. He takes your pain seriously. He took it so seriously that someone had to die for that sin. Someone had to die for that sin that was done against you. Someone died, and it was Jesus Christ. In the eternal scales of God, when he looks at that, he took that sin very, very seriously, but he addressed that sin See, when we look at someone else and we see what they've done to us, we can rest assured they didn't get away with it. God knew it. And Jesus paid for that. Justice was done. Now it's between them and God to get on the same page. That's not my problem. That's between that person and God. And something starts to happen in our soul before we couldn't forgive that person because they hurt us so badly, but we start to realize that God acted in Christ and God is seeking to forgive that person and God acted in love toward that person and we start trying to see that person as God sees them and slowly but surely we might not be able to forgive but we can accept God's forgiveness that person but then something happens inside us, we have peace. <laughs> we can sleep at night. That person's sin against us no longer owns us. We've given it to God. It's between them and God. God can heal us from that. That's the peace that comes from this cross and this new life that Jesus offers, this resurrection life. And there are two more gifts that God gives in addition to this peace. He gives grace and hope. Look at verse 2 in chapter 5. He says, through him or through whom our Lord Jesus Christ he's talking about, we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We receive this blessing of grace and hope. Uh, grace is a way of talking about God's love. In fact, I define grace as God's love even though we don't deserve it. God loves us even though we don't deserve it. 
Uh, perhaps you grew up in an environment where you began to feel like you had to earn someone's love. Maybe it was your parents, maybe it was a teacher or your employer or your friends. They had certain expectations and you had to live up to their expectations in order to get their love. And you never quite felt like you lived up to that expectation. On the cross and the resurrection, we learn about grace. We learn that God says, of course you didn't live up to his perfect standards. We accept that as truth. But here's the thing, I love you anyway. <laughs> my love for you is unconditional. You don't have to earn my love. In fact, you couldn't earn my love. <laughs> it's a free gift. That's what we learn in the cross. He's accepted us in our weakness and in our failure and our shortcomings and our mistakes. He said, you're still my daughter. You're still my son. And I love you. That's the grace in which we stand. We don't have to live in fear of not measuring up of anyone's expectations. Because God, who's the ruler of all the universe, says, I love you for who you are. And I acted to restore you. And sometimes what happens is because we grow up with those expectations ourselves, we push them off on others. We expect other people to live up to our expectations. We expect them to earn our love. But now in this grace in which we stand, we can give that grace away freely. We can love people even if they're not perfect. Doesn't mean we have to enable them or allow them to destroy themselves and others, but we can love them. God loved us. He gives us this grace, this way of seeing other people in their imperfections and saying, but they're still brothers and sisters. We can love them. See, this is a grace that comes through this cross and this resurrection. God gives us this life again, this new life of grace to carry on when we begin to get frustrated with ourselves and frustrated with others. Which is where hope comes in. We need that hope in our lives because we're not entirely right just yet. <laughs> this year I reached the golden age of 6-0. I'm 60 years old this year. In fact, just yesterday I had my first COVID shot, so I'm I'm inside. I got, I'm halfway there to protection. There we go. We drove around the little yard, and they put me over there. I sat there for 15 minutes, and I didn't keel over, so they let me go. There we go. And for most of those 60 years, I've been trying to live this path. I became a Christian earlier than I even remember when. I, my whole life, I remember being on this path, and I'm still a long way from right. I'm wrong way too many times, and I can get discouraged with myself. I forget that I'm in grace, and I start to lose hope. Will I ever get to what God wants me to be? Will I ever stop thinking the way I do? Will I ever stop feeling the way I do? Will I ever stop falling short? But this hope, I look at this resurrection of Jesus, and what he's saying is, that's your destiny, <laughs> to be restored in the image of Christ. It's not going to be you that's going to get you there. God is going to get you there. It gives you this hope, this belief that you're, you're going to get there in his time and in his way. We just have to stay engaged in the process. God does the work of changing. We don't change ourselves. God changes us. And if you come back next week, we're going to talk about how that works. How does God actually make us right when we're wrong? What process does he use? What power does he use? That's next week's talk. But this hope tells us we're going to get there. And it also gives us hope for our world. It grieves me. Every week it seems I'm reading that some young person took their life because they ran out of hope. I felt like such a waste. Because all of us in this room, we have hope in abundance. <laughs> When Jesus died on the cross, it looks like injustice won. It was a supreme act of injustice. He did absolutely nothing wrong, never sinned in his entire life, and yet here he was hanging on a cross, being accused 
of something he never did. He died for something he never did. It looks like injustice won. But God turned that injustice into the supreme act of justice and justification. He turned that entirely around. He used that event to make all things right in this world. To give people a way to move forward. And if that event didn't end badly, but in fact became the glory of God's hope, is there anything we need to give up hope about? <laughs> if we think that in our world injustice is winning or wickedness is winning, evil is winning, sin is winning, we just need to look at that event that the cross was followed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're not going to win. Sin is not going to win. Evil is not going to win. Death is not going to win. Defeat is not an option. God always gets what God wants. And God wants a family to love, to experience his love, to share love with one another. And God will win. And he has one in Jesus. And now he promises us that hope. We never, never, never have to give up on God's plan. The resurrection gives us that confidence and that hope. So what's the point? We started off asking the question, where's the undo button? <laughs> How can we start over again if we mess up? We found out that God has done so much more than give us a simple undo button. He's restarted all of creation. And we've learned that in the cross, God gives us every reason to start again. And to live the way he intended us to live. That's the big point. In the cross, God has given us every reason to start over. And to live the way God wants us to live. We have that concrete historical evidence in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So maybe you've grown up in the church and you've grown up and God's been part of your vocabulary. But maybe still as you sit here today, you're still trying to earn God's love. You may feel like you're still not measuring up. Somehow that's just always been a part of your tradition. Can I just invite you to set that all aside and look at the cross, accept the fact that we've all failed, every one of us, and we're all wrong until God makes us right. And he loves you just because. <laughs> his love is unconditional. You don't have to earn his love. He just gives it to you. Accept that love. Admit that we need him, and God starts the rebuilding process. Let me challenge all of us. You know, there's a world out there that needs hope right now. These are dark times, and there's a lot of hopelessness. In this cross, we've been given peace and grace and hope. We have to become experts in that for the world. We have to live it. We have to experience it in our lives. We have to talk about it, preach it, experience it, share it. Give it away as much as we can because the world needs this hope and it's a treasure that God has placed with his people. This week as you go out, try to be an expert in grace, an expert in hope. And pass that on to those around you. So where do we go from here? Uh, you'll notice I just covered the first couple verses in the passage we read today. As I began to work on the sermon, I realized that this was an important shift in Paul's argument. It's kind of like a very sharp curve, and you'd want to slow down and take that curve carefully. Those three verses are a linchpin in his entire argument, so I wanted to make sure we slowed down and caught that. So this Wednesday, I'll be looking at the rest of that passage and talk about perseverance. How do we persevere when all these things happen to us? How do we keep believing that God is making things right when so many things start to go wrong? We're going to talk about that in the devotional this week. Probably on Wednesday, we'll put that video up on our YouTube channel. And if you want to go deeper, I have a class, dirkscorner.com. You just go out there. There's why the cross goes deeper into some of this stuff with more scripture. Feel free to, to do that. But most of all, just continue this journey of 
grace and hope and faith. And if you have any questions, my email address, I put it out there, it's in the bulletin, it's just dirk at roserchurch.com. Dirk at roserchurch.com. You just send me an email and let me help you find that peace, that hope, that grace that God wants you to find. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this truth revealed in Scripture. We thank you so much for this fact that you give us your grace and your hope, and your peace. That you give us your love, even though we don't deserve it. Father, my prayer for all of us is that in this journey from being wrong to being right, you would encourage us, strengthen us, encourage our resolve to stay on the path to follow you, knowing full well that you will bring us that new life, that resurrection life in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we dedicate ourselves to that work in that way. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.